So it really is amazing how God works because I didn't plan to get into these chapters in light of all the events that are happening there in, in Israel. It really is heartbreaking to see all the destruction, all the murder, all the just the killing of innocents. Man, the devil was working overtime in social media about that. And it's dividing a lot of people. Well, we already see it. You know, if you saw some of the protests uh, yesterday throughout the country, a lot of hate being spewed, a lot of anti-Semitism being spewed. I really never would have imagined that we'd live in a, in a day where the day would come that I would see so much hatred against Jews. Now again, I'm going to be talking more about why they're the rightful tenants there in Israel. But we'll be in Joshua chapter 13 this morning. We were with us last week when we covered chapter, a few chapters, two and a half chapters. Uh, when we ended chapter 12 there, we saw how Israel had pretty much, they conquered all the major c cities that surrounded them, the cities to the east, west, north, south, they pretty much conquered it all, just like, well, they didn't do it, the Lord did it, but just like the Lord said, they, they, uh, the Lord was with them and he, they were victorious. Now, also, scholars have, that have dissected the book of Joshua even further have said that chapter 12 marks the end of the first half of this book. And so now as we get into the second half of Joshua, you're going to notice several differences from the first half. For instance, in terms of subject matter, there aren't any more battles recorded. Secondly, you're also going to notice that lists will uh, predominate here. Whereas earlier, you pretty much had narrative stories. That was the major thing there. That was the rule in that first half of Joshua. And lastly, you're also going to notice that the pace begins to slow to a more relaxed tone. And there's hardly any action like what was seen in those first 12 chapters of Joshua. And so what I've decided to do, I know this is, going through this, these chapters may seem a little mundane. You, maybe you're not used to uh, reading, you know, throughout you know, these chapters. They all seem to look alike. But I'm going to try to cover, I'm going to see where the Lord leads me as I cover these next few chapters. But... I just want you to be a little patient because there's still a lot that can be learned, can be said, even in these chapters. Now, again, rather than just covering a bunch of chapters in one sitting like I did last, last week, um, I'm going to slow it down a bit so that I don't overload you with a bunch of information all at once. So again, even though the next few chapters may seem redundant, there really is a lot of lessons that we can all learn from these upcoming chapters. So I just recommend that you just enjoy the ride, the cruise down these next few chapters and just soak in the wonder of God's wisdom and his amazing love for you. Well, now that Joshua had successfully completed the first half of his divine commission to conquer the enemy and take control of the land and cities, 
he now has to fulfill the second part of his commission by dividing the land so that each tribe could claim its inheritance and enjoy what God had given them. And so today here in chapter 13, we're specifically going to read about the initial process of how that land was distributed. But before I start reading, it's important to understand that this was, or it was a climactic moment in the life of this young nation. Why is that? Because after centuries of Egyptian bondage, dec decades in the barren wilderness, years of hard fighting in Canaan, the hour had come. It was now time that the Israelites could at last settle down to build homes, cultivate the soil, raise families, and live in peace in their own land. See, the promised land was a gift of God's love. To see to see the value of that gift, all they simply had to do was to obey him, obey his word, and, and, and follow him. But sadly, over time, they did. They eventually lost sight of the value of that gift. They began to disobey and ignore God. I read a story of a woman who was married to her husband for half a century, 50 years. One day she received a letter from a company concerning monetary funds. She put the letter aside thinking it uh, was an irrelevant hoax or a hoax. You guys do that, you just get a letter and you just put it in the, one of the drawers and forget about it. And then years later you pull it out and you're like, oh my goodness, I forgot about this. Well, after a long period of time had passed, she noticed the envelope containing the letter was from a rather obscure place. She opened the envelope and began to read it. Then she asked herself the question, what do I have to lose if I follow up on the directions of this letter? The letter requested her to contact the Department of Unclaimed Funds. Several weeks later, she and her husband received a check for multiple thousands of dollars. Though she didn't even know it existed, the money had been there waiting for her the whole time. So church, as I cover this chapter, I hope that you will see the value of the gift you've all been given. See, because of the victory won by God in Christ, every Christian, every believer can walk by faith in the Spirit when we cannot see the assurance of victory. Amazing, beautiful. So let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful you have us here thankful that you, know, you have a wonderful plan for each and every one of, us, one of us. And in that plan, we know it's to become more like your son, Jesus. You know that this life is challenging. You know that this life is, isn't always going to be easy. Lord, but I pray for those that are going through hard times that you will give them the strength and courage they need. May they see that you have kept your promises in the past and will continue to keep your promises now and in the future. We are your children. We know that you will never abandon us. So speak to us now, Lord, as we cover Joshua chapter 13. Show us things that 
we've never seen, blow our minds away. Lord, so we can just be more and more in love with you and in awe of you. Pray for those watching that you also bless them and speak to them powerfully. Keep us safe here now, Lord. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Joshua chapter 13. Joshua chapter 13. Do, I'm going to read the entire thing. All right, so let's do this. The Word of God says, Joshua was now old, advanced in age. And the Lord said to him, You have become old, advanced in age. But a great deal of the land remains to be possessed. This is the land that remains. All the, dist all the districts of the Philistines and the Jashurites. Jashurites. From the Shihor, east of Egypt, to the border of Ekron on the north, considered to be Canaanite territory. The five Philistine ruler, rulers of Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron, as well as the Avites in the south, all the land of the Canaanites from Era to the Sidian, Sidonians to Aphek, and as far as the border of the Amorites, the land of the Gebelites, and all Lebanon east from Baal Gad, Gad, below Mount Hermon, to the entrance of Hamath, all the inhabitants of the hill country from Lebanon to Misrephoth, Misref, Mame, all the Sidonians. I will drive them out before the Israelites only to distribute the land as an inheritance for Israel, as, of, as I have commanded you. Therefore, divide this land as an inheritance to the nine tribes and a half, to the nine tribes and half the tribe of Manasseh. With the other half of the tribe of Manasseh, the Reubenites and the Gadites had to receive the inheritance Moses gave them beyond the Jordan to the east, just as Moses, the Lord's servant, had given them. From Aroer to the rim of the Arnon Valley, along with the city in the middle of the valley, all the Med Medeba Plateau as far as Dibon, and all the cities of King Sihon and the Amorites, who re reigned in Hesh Heshbon, to the border of the Amorites, Ammonites. Also Gilead and the territory of the Gesher, Gesherites and Machashites, Thites, all Mount Hermon, all Bashan, to Sal Saleka, the whole kingdom of Og in Bashan, who reigned in Ashereth and Ed Edri. He was one of the remaining Ref Rephaim. Moses struck them down and drove them out. But the Israelites did not drive out the Gesh Gesherites and Machathites. So Gesher and Machath still live, live in Israel today. He did not, however, give any inheritance to the tribe of Levi. This was their inheritance, just as he had promised, the offerings made by fire to the Lord, the God of Israel. To the tribe of Reuben's descendants, by their, by their clans, Moses gave this as their territory from Aror to the rim of Arnon Valley, along with the city in the middle of the valley, the whole plateau as far as Med Medeba with Heshbon and all its cities on the plateau, Dibon, Bamoth Baal, Beth Baal, Meon, Jehaz, Kedemoth, Mephath, Kiriath, Kiriath, Aim, Sibma, Zareth, Shahar, on the hills of the valley. Beth, Beth Peor, the slopes of Pisgah, and Beth Jeshemoth, all the cities of the plateau, and all the kingdoms of the king of Sihon, of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon. Moses had killed them 
and the chiefs of the Midian, Evi, Rakem, Zer, Hur, and Reba, the princes of Sihon who lived in the land, along with those in Along with those the Israelites put to death, they also killed a diviner, Balaam, son of Beor, with the sword. The border of the Reubenites was the Jordan and its plain. This was the inheritance of the Reubenites by their clans with the cities and their settlements. To the tribe of the Gadites, by their clans, Moses gave as their territory, again, excuse me for the names, Jazer and all the cities of Gilead and half the land of the Ammonites to Aor near Rabbath from Heshbon to Ramath, Mizpeh and Bet Betonim and from Mahanaim to the border of the Beer in the valley. In the valley, Beth, Haram, Beth, Nimrah, Sukkoth and Zaphon, the rest of the kingdom of kings Sihon of Heshbon. Their land also included the Jordan and its territory as far as the edge of the Sea of Chen Chenereth on the east side of the Jordan. This was the inheritance of the Gadites by their clans with their cities and their settlements. One more section. Stick with me. And to half the tribe of Manasseh that is, half the tribe of Manasseh's descendants by their clans. Moses gave this as their territory. From Mahanim through all Bashan, all the kingdom of King Og and Bashan, including all of Jair's villages, Jair's villages that are in Bashan, 60 cities, but half of Gilead, and Og's royal cities in Bashan. Ashtaroth and Edri, are the descendants of Machir, son of Manasseh. That is half the descendants of Machir by their clans. These were the portions Moses gave them on the plains of Moab beyond the Jordan east of Jericho. But Moses did not give a portion to the tribe of Levi. Levi, the Lord, the God of Israel, was their inheritance just as he had promised them. Thank you for sticking with me. As you can see, I tried, practice, I tried practicing the names, but even then, I, I would have spent all day just trying to write, it up, write them out. Um, so, again, as you can see, chapter 13, it can get pretty long, maybe monotonous, but some amazing stuff there, and I'll, I'll get right to it in just a minute. But I know it may sound a little confusing, like, what are we talking about and all that, so guess what? I have another map for you. I decided to give you another map and kind of show you what we're talking about. And again, this is a preview. Next few chapters, we're going to talk about the other tribes and their inheritance. But uh, yeah, we're going to show you the, um, the map of the 12 tribes of Israel. You also have this in the back of your Bibles if you need to see it, uh, have a closer view. But um, is it there, the map? While he gets there, let me, let me explain what we just read a little bit more. There it is. All right. We just we don't have to show the entire map, maybe just what we some of the some of the tribes that we did cover this morning. Now there are two people that pretty much stand out here for the most part that I want to talk about just a little bit more about. Now, obviously, the first person is Joshua. Now, verse 1 begins by telling us that Joshua was now an old man. In chapter four, 24, we're going to see that he eventually lived to be 110 years old. Now, up to this point, he had accomplished a lot. His resume was long. Everything that he did was amazing. 
and he lived a life of faithfulness to God. In fact, back in Joshua chapter 11, verse 15, it, there it offers a commendable summary of his, of his service. And there it says, That is what Joshua did, leaving nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. He was obedient. He was faithful. He knew he had a heart for the Lord. Now, even though Joshua was pretty old, and it's, I think it's funny that, you know, it mentions it twice. And imagine if a chapter started in, about you and it said, now, you know, that person was pretty old. The angel was pretty old now, you know. And then God repeats it, you know. He's saying, you're old now, Joshua. But uh, now, even though Joshua was pretty old, we see that the Lord isn't done with him yet and still has a job that he still needed to do. The Lord reminds him of this, a great deal of land remains to be possessed. See, back there and back in chapter 1, verse 4, God had promised Israel the entire land of Canaan from the wilderness and Lebanon to the great river the Euphrates River, all the land of the Hittites and west of the Mediterranean Sea. It's huge. They weren't done yet. Still a lot to go. So it appears again that they only had, even at this old age, and a long time had passed between chapters 12 and 13, still a lot of work that needed to be done. They only still had a fraction of the land that was promised to them. There were still some unclaimed packages of land that needed to be possessed. So God called Joshua to continue the job, regardless of how old he was, regardless of his age. Now again, we know Joshua by now. It wasn't like he had to sit there and think about his options. Think about, you know, man, is this going to work out for me? Is this going to harm my retirement? Again, he didn't have uh, to consider his options or he didn't take his old age as a reason to say, you know what, Lord? No, thanks. I'm good. I'm, I'm good living the retired life. No, not at all. Joshua's faith in God's promises were still as strong as ever. His body may be worn down, maybe frail, probably walked with a limp. Those of you who are, you know, wake up sore all the time, Paul, you know what that feels like. I know I'm starting to, you know, I hear that. Robin hears that, uh, every time I, I get up. But I, I hear her too. She's, uh, both of us. But his faith was as strong as ever. See, folks, in a similar way, no matter how much you've done or how much you will do in your Christian life, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. There's still a lot. While we're still here, while you're still breathing, while you're still alive, God has a plan for you. God has a plan for us. And there's still work to be done. Don't forget that. Keep that in mind. You just feel like there's nothing else. There's nothing the Lord, you know, there's, there's nothing for me. No, there is. He's just setting up the right opportunity, the right time for that to happen. And he hasn't forgot about you. He, ha he knows your heart. 
you just got to ask yourself, sure, my body may be weak, but is my faith as strong as Joshua? Is my faith strong? Again, no matter how much you've done or will do in your Christian life, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Now, the second person that stands out here in our chapter is Caleb. Caleb. Now, as believers, we may retire from our jobs. Guess what? Not from ministry. We don't retire from, from ministry. Ministry ought to be a lifelong thing. Serve and serve with love for your entire life. And if it's not here in this church, maybe the Lord is going to put you in a different church You know, 20 years from now. I hope it'll be here, but he may be calling you somewhere else. And But you're going to retire from ministry. It's something that you do. It's in you. You have that passion. You get excited about doing it. Just how Isaac was excited about the eclipse. You just have that excitement. You have that joy of just coming here, serving, going to one of the conferences and serving, just being helpful, using you where the Lord has you. Again, your jobs you can retire from, but not from ministry. The Lord said to the church at Smyrna in Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. When we get to chapter 14, Caleb here, a guy now, him in his mid-80s, will pursue his greatest challenges, his, his greatest challenge, the conquering of the Anakim in order to possess Hebron, the, tor- the territory the Lord had promised 45 years before. That'll be an interesting story when we get there, but we're not talking about Joshua. We're talking about Caleb, the guy who took over for, from Joshua, for Joshua. Caleb now in his mid-80s was used by God to conquer the Anakim. Now, I mention this because it's important for believers to not only begin ministry well, but to also finish ministry well. You guys remember Saul? King Saul? There's two Sauls in the Bible, one in the Old Testament, one in, in, the, Old, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. But the first one, the one in the Old Testament, King Saul, the first king of Israel, he began his kingship. Oh, so good. Began it well. But if you read the story and are familiar with it, you know that it ended tragically on the wrong side of his sword. Of his sword. But on the other hand, Saul, the great apostle of the New Testament, he started his uh, before he got involved in, in the ministry, he persecuted Christians. He persecuted the church. He put some to death. You would, call, you would probably call him today a terrorist, a very evil man, evil man. But he ended his ministry victoriously. He ended it victoriously. So again, the point is begin it well and finish it well. So now, although I already mentioned here Joshua and Caleb, this leads me to mention someone else. You, the believer. As a Christian, You must strive to be consistently faithful so you don't leave behind an unfinished past. 
See, because of the victory won by God in Christ, you can now walk by faith in the Spirit even when you can't see the assurance of the victory. Joshua was reminded by the Lord of unpossessed, unclaimed territories. So here's the question. What areas and possibilities remain unclaimed and unpossessed in your life? Work, in your, in your life, work, and ministry. In all areas of your life, what is still... What, does, what is still need to be claimed or what remains unclaimed and unpossessed? Can you answer that question honestly? What doors have you failed to enter and what mountains do you refuse to tunnel through? What talents and gifts remain undeveloped? These are challenging questions to ask yourself, and if you're truthfully really serious about growing as a believer, growing as a Christian, drawing near to Christ, becoming more Christ-like, these are questions that you need to answer. And once you have, do it. Tunnel through that mountain. Develop those undeveloped gifts. Claim those areas in your life, work and ministry that you've kind of left to the side and give them to God. But remember, the Lord wants all of it. Remember, the Lord wants every single aspect of your life. He wants you just to hand it over. Church, that's what surrender is, right? Someone surrenders their life, they're surrendering all of it, not just a part of it, not just a portion of it. Lord, this is mine, I'm going to keep it. No. He wants you to surrender it all. Another lesson this chapter tells us is that, is that we need to remember God's promises and recount them. Joshua 13 notes there would be promised uh, there would be promised land and territories the Israelites would allow the Canaanites to continue to inhabit but the Israelites did not drive them out in chapter 15 verse 63 the list is an indictment of Israel's failure to possess unclaimed packages of territory. And there it, it says, but the descendants of Judah could not drive out the Jebusites who lived in Jerusalem. So, Jeb, so the Jebusites still live in Jerusalem among the descendants of Judah today. However, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites still live in Ephraim today, but they are forced laborers. And that is found in chapter 16, verse 10. And then, again, we see in chapter 13, but the Israelites did not drive out the Geshersites and the Makathites. So Gesher and Makath, Makath still live in Israel today. This was the land on the west side of the Jordan. The trend continues east. The descendants of Manasseh could not possess these cities because the Canaanites were determined to stay in this land. Does that ring a familiar bell? The failure to completely follow God's commands but leave some Canaanite people in the land would bring about much crisis later on down the road. God says you need to wipe them out. You need to wipe out these people because they're just going to be a thorn on your side. They're going to be, they're always going to cause problems. And you're going to be tempted 
to follow their gods. But they didn't listen. The failure to completely follow God's commands but leave some Canaanite people in the land, again, would leave too much uh, to a crisis down the road. Church, God's ways are not our ways. And His thoughts are not our thoughts. It's in our best interest as believers to completely, to completely obey Him because only God knows the beginning, before the beginning begins. Did you get that? It's in our best interest as believers to completely obey Him because only God knows the beginning before the beginning begins. In addition to those territories uh, still in the hands of the original dwellers, there were other unpossessed territories occupied by the Canaanite enemies of Israel. Only the two and a half tribes who chose to set up residence in the land on the east side of the Jordan had received their territorial inheritance. Manasseh, Reuben, right? Reuben, yes. Reuben, get it? Was it Gad? Manasseh, yeah, half of the tribe, there we go, yeah, half the tribe of Manasseh and the two tribes. I'm getting myself confused. Um, only the two, two and a half tribes who chose to set up residence in the land of the east side of Jordan had received the territorial inheritance. The nine and a half tribes of Israel who would live on the west side of the Jordan were still waiting to receive, receive their land allotments. And Joshua was to be their secretary of housing. He was to direct the apportioning of the tribal lots to the nine and a half tribes. No, it wasn't time for retirement, but for a renewed engagement and investment in his expanded role. The Lord had given Moses, the senior statesman, what he needed to complete his mission. It was said of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not weak, and his vitality had not left him. Caleb said at the age of 85, I am still as strong today as I was the day Moses sent me out. And now that Joshua is advanced in, his, in years, again, mid-80s, he's ready to write another chapter in his autobiography. Amazing. Are you ready to write another chapter in your autobiography? He is not simply a senior citizen. He's a man of God who possesses X, Y, and Zs. Extra years of zest. A third lesson from this chapter is the importance of keeping your promises to God. In Numbers 32, Reuben, Gad, and half the, eastern, and half the tribe of eastern Manasseh applied, applied to Moses for an early settlement on the east side of the Jordan, the wilderness side. God had promised Abraham the entire land of Canaan for all 12 tribes of Israel to dwell in, not just the nine and a half tribes. The two and a half tribes they liked the Gilead, the Gilead territory on the east side because of its lush and rich pasture land for the livestock. But Moses reminded them that the children of Israel had been in a 38-year wilderness wandering, holding pattern, 
before they crossed the Jordan River. Ten of the twelve spies sent to the land of Canaan returned to the congregation of Israel with a doubtful and discouraging report. And so what did the people do? They adopted the report and subsequently declined to engage the Canaanites for the promised land. See, Moses was thinking that the two and a half tribes, their intention was to abandon their brothers as they fought to evict their enemies from the promised land. In Moses' mind, the two and a half tribes would forego the fighting to enjoy a conflict-free and carefree life on the east side. That they just, brothers, guys, just you take care of it. We're good where we're at. You know, it's our time to chill now. That's what Moses is worried about. That would communicate another doubtful and discouraging message to the other nine and a half tribes. But when the two and a half tribes assured Moses it would leave their families and livestock on the east side and join their brothers in battle on the west side, Moses approved of their early settlement on the east. Where are the, where are the northeast people? I'm talking about the east side, west side. Thinking to myself here. However, they reneged and went back on their promise, and they would, have, they would have sinned greatly against the Lord. But if you don't do this, Moses said, you will, cert you will certainly sin against the Lord. Be sure your sin will catch up with you. And that's in Numbers 32, verse 23. Now, based on this covenant... Moses distributed the land inheritance on the east side to the two full tribes of Gad and Reuben and half the tribe of Manasseh. So are you following here? Let me also show you how Joshua and the Israelites now kept their promise. I just explained that, again, that uh, the importance of Again, that two and a half tribes kept their promise. Now let's see how Joshua and the Israelites kept their promise. Joshua, Moses' assistant, and now successor, successor after his death, was distributed the land inheritance on the west side to the nine full tribes of Judah, Ephraim, Benjamin, Simeon, Simeon Zebulun, Issachar, Asher, Naphtali, and Dan, as well as, well as to the, as the half the tribe of western Manasseh. Wait, isn't there a Levi tribe? The tribe of Levi? What happened to Levi and his descendants or his people? Had they been left out of the inheritance, Levi was a son of Jacob too. Why was he left out? We're told, we're clearly told there, God is Levi's inheritance. God is Levi's inheritance. For the Levitical tribe, the Lord would provide furnished pasture lands and dwelling place, places through the 48 Levitical cities scattered across Israel. The reality of Levi's inheritance is made clear throughout the book of Joshua. Again, let me read what it says in verse 14 of our chapter we read. He did not, however, give any inheritance to the tribe of Levi. This was their inheritance, just as he had promised, the food offerings made to the Lord, the God of Israel. Also, um, in verse 33, but Moses did not give a portion to the tribe of Levi. The Lord, the God of Israel, was their inheritance, just as he had promised them. 
And then in the next chapter, chapter 14, verse 4, it also says this, And again, no portion of the land was given to the Levites except cities to live in. A final lesson this chapter can teach us is to possess the promised land. The word inheritance is found over 50 times in these, in the next nine chapters. And it's a, it's a very important word. The Jews, my friends, church, inherited their land. They didn't win their land as spoils of battle or purchase their land, their land in a business transaction. No, again, they inherited their land. The Lord, who was the sole owner, leased the land to them. They were just tenants, and to this day, they are the rightful tenants. We've seen, again, throughout this chapter, promise. And that's what they were ready for, and that's what they did. They went after it. It was promised all the way back. This land was promised to the Jews, to the nation of Israel, all the way back. In Abraham's time, was, you know, the promise was given to Abraham. But we must again remember the land, all the land, is the Lord's. And He is the one who leases it. And He leased this piece of land to the Israelites. In Le in Leviticus 25, in the NIV, it says this, The land must not be sold permanently, the Lord instructed them, because the land is mine, and you are but aliens and my tenants. Can you imagine having God as your landlord? <laughs> Do you pay your rent every month? Keep the noise down. <laughs> Can you imagine, again, having God as your landlord. The rent God required, it was easy. It was simply Israel's obedience to the law. As long as the Jewish people honored the Lord with their worship and obedience, he would bless them, make their land productive, and keep their nation at peace with their neighbors. When Israel agreed to the blessings and, cursing, and curses at Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal in Joshua chapter 8, they accepted the conditions of what is called the Palestinian covenant. They accepted the condition of what is called the Palestinian co uh, covenant. Their ownership of the land was purely the gracious act of God, but their possession and enjoyment of the land depended on their submission and obedience to God. Can you imagine what that land would look like today? Right now, if they were obedient to God. If they were obeying, really obeying and submitting themselves to Lord. First of all, they would recognize that Jesus is the Messiah. And then they just would be seeking the Lord on a consistent basis. This is their history. This is their land. This is a people that is a special people to this day. Yeah, they've been 
kind of messed up there when they rejected Jesus. But one day, we're told that they will come to their senses. They will see that Jesus is really the Messiah. Jumping ahead of myself again, but the promised land was a gift of God's love. It was a gift of God's love to the Jewish people. Have you ever gifted something to somebody just because you love them? It wasn't about really about them, but you just did it because you love them. I feel bad. I know, again, my wife has given me a lot of things, and I know she's given them to me out of love, and I, you know, figuratively, I've kind of just chucked it to the side. Oh, that's not what I wanted. You know. But I know she's done it. She's given me a lot out of love. Now, if this was my, my wife, I'm sure many of us, many of you had done the same thing with the gifts that he's given you. So this was their uh, God's gift of love to them. If the Israelites loved the Lord, they would want to obey Him and please Him in the way they used His land. They would be good tenants. Unfortunately, they defied the Lord, disobeyed the law, and defiled the land. So God had to chasten them. And they were exiled to the land of Babylon. And they've been dispersed, pretty much living abroad since then. And, and it wasn't until this past century that they finally came back to their, home, their homeland. There's a lot of history there. Don't believe the lies that are out there trying to confuse you. Read the Bible. Find out the agreement that the British made with the Arabs concerning the, that land there. The Israelites were willing to have the Palestinians as their neighbors and work things out. You all know Arabs hate, the Muslims hate the Jews. They want them out. They want to annihilate them. They want to just get rid of them. They wouldn't, they didn't want to work with them. And Israel tried and tried, you know, and I'm not saying they didn't do anything. They didn't do horrible things. They're guilty of a lot of bad, doing a lot of horrible, bad things. What do you, what do you expect from a people that is constantly on edge? They're constantly getting threatened they're going to defend themselves, and sometimes they're going to defend themselves in very horrible, ugly ways. This, again, this is a fight that's been going on for centuries and centuries. The Israelites have been fighting the locals there ever since they entered the Promised Land. And they're just going to keep fighting it out. But again, this land belongs to Israel. God gave it to them as an inheritance. They're the rightful tenants. Now, church, the land of Canaan is of supreme importance in salvation history. Why is that? Because God promised Abraham that he would give his descendants, his, his posterity, a great land. Well, Canaan is this land. In this land, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, would be born in Bethlehem of Judea. What a blessing. 
then the land of Canaan goes beyond a physical reality for Israel to a spiritual reality for all of us believers in Christ and accept Jesus as Savior. Because the Father and the Son sent the Spirit, God lives within people. He lives within you if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Paul wrote this, wrote to the Ephesians concerning Christ, through whom we receive the inheritance of the Holy Spirit. There in Ephesians 1, it says this, In Him we have also received an inheritance. In Him you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to praise of His glory. Here's the point. All Christians, all believers are part of a royal priesthood in contrast to Israel's priest who came from the tribe of Levi. And so as a royal priesthood, all believers have the Holy Spirit as their inheritance. So in light of this, I once again want to remind you that because of the victory won by God in Christ, as a Christian, you can walk by faith in the Spirit even when you cannot see the assurance of victory. And I hope that's become clear as I've explained this chapter. There's a lot, but that's the point here. Though you can't see it yet. You have that assurance. You can be assured of the victory. Jesus won already. As a result, because he's your Lord and Savior, because you have the Holy Spirit in you, you are also victorious. So this includes having also absolute, absolute certainty, absolute, absolute certainty of your salvation today, right now. You don't have to think about it anymore. You don't have to question it. You can have absolute assurance of your salvation today. If you just come to the cross and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. If you're watching, listening to this message, and you're ready to do that, you're ready to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and make him, as, make him your Lord and Savior. I want you to close your eyes and bow your head. And let me lead you in a prayer to be saved. With all your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I now believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. And so now I ask you to fill me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. Pray that Seriously, you have absolute certainty now, absolute certainty of salvation. Let us know that you did, you prayed that, we want to hear about it, we want to help you in your next steps. If you're here in the Northeast, we invite you to come visit us here on uh, the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway, Gateway South. I hope you have a great week, be blessed.
Bless, bless somebody else. Bless someone at work or your school, wherever you may be. Um, and just be careful out there. Uh, this whole situation in Israel is going to cause a lot of division. And, and make sure that whenever you're interacting with people that you do it in love. Don't let hate spew out of your mouth. Well, thank you again. Um, hope you have a great week. Looking forward to seeing you all next time. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.